and good long-term outcomes as well. And the long-term outcomes are further shown here, where the overall survival is about 16 months compared to, as you saw earlier, nine months, which would be the expected standard. The toxicities of carfilzomib are briefly outlined here. The most important thing to remember is that unlike bortezomib, which can give you anywhere from 35 to 45 percent of patients developing a treatment emergent neuropathy, with carfilzomib, that's only about 10 percent, and almost all of those are grade one and two with virtually no grade three or four, which are the most severe level of events in terms of neuropathy. Other things that you should know about, as with bortezomib, when it first came out, we used to give it intravenously and twice a week, and later on we learned that we could give it subcutaneously and maybe once a week. We're also learning new things about how best to use carfilzomib. This is one study that suggests very strongly that perhaps carfilzomib at a higher dose. The approved dose is 20 milligrams per meter squared in the first cycle, and then 27 milligrams per meter squared starting with cycle two. But because of some studies in solid tumors, the patients at slow Kettering looked at maybe a higher dose and they looked at 56 milligrams per meter squared, so more than twice the dose of what is currently approved. And the study is relatively small, but you can see that the responses were quite good, with more than half of patients having a response, suggesting that the higher dose may be more active than the currently approved dose and there is a randomized study that we are now doing in the United States, which is comparing the standard dose carfilzomib with DEX to the high dose of carfilzomib with DEX. So we'll know the answer to whether the high dose is really better in a randomized fashion. Other things that you can consider, as with bortezomib, where some people now use it once a week, there also are studies looking at the use of carfilzomib being given once per week. And this was the study that looked at that, which was reported at ASH. What they found, as you might expect, is if you give it once per week, you can give a higher dose than if you give it on two consecutive days. And the feeling was that 77 milligrams per meter squared given once per week with dexamethasone look like the best tolerated dose. So remember, that's up from 56 if you give it two days in a row. And here, the overall response rate was 67%, with almost 90% of patients having a minor response or better. So it's tough to compare different small studies like this. You really need a randomized trial. But it certainly looks like if you give higher dose and maybe once per week, the responses are going to improve. And you'll see later that there is a randomized study ongoing comparing bortezomib and dex with the higher dose carfilzomib and dex with carfilzomib given twice weekly. In addition, carfilzomib is a good partner for other drugs. And you saw some of these data earlier. Michael Wong at MD Anderson was the leader on this particular study where carfilzomib was given twice a week in the first three weeks, followed by the fourth week off, and lenalidomide was given daily for three weeks, and also dexamethasone was included as well. And here are some of the dose levels that were explored. And you also saw these efficacy data earlier, where there was an overall response rate of 80% almost in the cohort that got the planned dose, and the clinical benefit rate was quite good as well. So that's a very good number, I think, for patients in the relapse setting. And you probably know that there is a completed study which looked at lenalidomide and dexamethasone as a salvage versus carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And we're hoping that the data from that trial will be available later this year for presentation. 
Honolulamide is one of the newest kids on the block, if you will, a third generation IMID, which was recently approved in the United States, and that was based on this study, which looked at either pomalutamide alone or pomalutamide with low-dose dexamethasone. The efficacy data here were quite good. Overall response rates you can see up here, responses ranging usually in about the 30% range, so a little bit better than what you saw from carfilzomib, but remember the carfilzomib data were with carfilzomib alone, and this is with pomalutamide mostly plus dexamethasone. So if you add dexamethasone to carfilzomib, the numbers go higher, actually, than with pomalutamide and dexamethasone. And the durability data here were quite good. Also, you know about the randomized data that looked at POM and low-dose dex versus high-dose dexamethasone that Thanos Demopoulos presented a while back. And the combination was better in terms of overall survival than was the high-dose dexamethasone. And the same thing was true in patients who had disease that was refractory to both bortezomib and levolutamide. One of the things, of course, that we try to do in the relapse setting is to combine drugs. And Jayton Shaw, another one of my colleagues at MD Anderson, led this trial which you saw briefly earlier, where carfilzomib with pomalidomide and dexamethasone were put together. This is what the regimen looked like in the first six cycles with carfilzomib twice a week for three weeks, pomalidomide for three weeks on and one week off, and dexamethasone was given once weekly at the standard low dose and these are the updated data, which were presented as an oral presentation at this year's ASH. You can see overall response rate is now 70%, and if you include minor responders, it's 83%, with a median overall survival that hasn't yet been reached. And I think you saw earlier the nice data about deletion of 17P, which are also shown here. So even with deletion 17P, which usually is a very bad prognostic factor, although the numbers are small, the deletion 17P patients did just as well, not just in terms of response rate, but in terms of response durability. Because most of the time, the problem with the high-risk people is not that they don't respond, they do, the problem is they don't hold their response. And yet with this regimen, it looks like they are doing both, responding and holding it. Now of course, pomalutamide is a good drug that can be combined with bortezomib and dex as well. And here Paul Richardson did this study to try to identify the maximum tolerated dose. And actually it was found to be very well tolerated. And the overall response rate here was 73%. So that's a little bit lower than our experience with carfilzomib pomalidomide and dex. And remember that in the car pom dex study, all of those patients were lenalidomide refractory. So that was a slightly different and more difficult patient population in that regard. Other than imids and proteasome inhibitors, we still need other drugs to help us against myeloma. And one of the drugs we've been very interested in is this drug called ARRY520, which is a kinesin spindle protein inhibitor. And just to give you an idea of what that means, if you remember back to your biology days in class, you probably remember that when cells divide, the chromosomes line up in the middle and microtubules attach to them and then you have motors that pull on the microtubules to separate them so that each of the daughter cells gets a full copy of all of the chromosomes. So what this drug does is it inhibits KSP, or kinesin spindle protein. And that's the motor, if you will, that pulls on the microtubules to separate them. And when that happens, you get this disordered spindle. The cells can't divide. One of the things that happens is that MCL1 levels drop as a result, and because MCL1 is very important to myeloma cell survival, you get apoptosis. 
there have been a number of studies with ARRY 520, and it now has a name. It's called Phalanacin. This is a drug which is given two days in a row every other week. You do need to give some growth factor support because neutropenia is the main side effect. But if you give Neupogen or something comparable, you can really avoid that problem. And there are very few febrile neutropenias involved. Here are some data with either phalanacid as a single agent or phalanacid with dexamethasone. And you can see response rates about 20%. But this group here that got the combination with dexamethasone were people who were triple refractory meaning they had disease refractory to bortezomib, to lenalidomide, and to dexamethasone. So the numbers actually here are somewhat encouraging. And in particular, if you look at patients who have low levels of a protein called AAG, you can see that now the response rate is about 30%. This is a protein which is found in the serum which actually binds to this drug. And so the thought is that if you have high levels, you don't get enough free drug available to target the myeloma cells. Survival curves are shown here. And again, you can see that with the people that have a low AAG, the overall survival is going to be probably about a year or more. And remember, these are triple refractory patients, so worse than the groups that you saw earlier and there will be studies of this regimen forthcoming in a phase three setting. Now I mentioned earlier that carfilzomib is a good partner, and so again, my colleague Jaden Shaw put together a combination of phalanacid with carfilzomib and looked at the combination in patients with relapsed and refractory myeloma. It's fairly easy to combine because you're already giving the carfilzomib day one, two, 8, 9, 15, and 16. So all you do is add a little bit of this ARRY520 on days 1 and 2, and 15 and 16, and give some Neupogen. And although the numbers are still small, the efficacy data so far shows a 63% minor response rate or better. All of these patients were bortezomib refractory. And in the US, there's about to be started a phase 3 study which will look at carfilzomib as the control versus carfilzomib plus ARRY520. And if that's positive, it will lead to an approval of this KSP inhibitor. Other drugs that look exciting, one drug that caught my eye at ASH was this AKT inhibitor. Actually, my colleague Peter Voorhees at UNC, who I trained when I was still there and he was a fellow, has grown up and that's always nice to see. He's making a good name for himself. And they did studies with this AKT inhibitor that showed good overall response rates in a relapsed and refractory setting. And again, the numbers are small, but not that bad. And if you've got bortezomib refractory disease, you can still have good responses with 43% overall. And I think this is exciting because we know that AKT should be a good target for myeloma. It's just that some of the previous drugs that were billed as AKT inhibitors probably really weren't. And that's why the studies didn't look all that great. And of course, monoclonal antibodies are going to be very important. I always find it somewhat ironic that a disease which is characterized by production of a monoclonal antibody we've not been able to attack so far with an antibody. But fortunately, that time is changing. And there's a lot of these, so I don't have time to go into all of them, but certainly one of them is daratumumab, which recognizes CD38. And we know from the phase one studies that as a single agent, this drug has a substantial benefit. And there is a registration study now ongoing with this drug and when you combine it with lenalidomide and dexamethasone in this phase one, you can see virtually all patients had at least a partial response and it's very well tolerated. So again, the phase three is being planned, which is looking at len and dex versus daratumumab 
plus lenalidomide and dexamethasone. So that will hopefully get going pretty soon. Other drugs, there's one compound called SAR650984, which is another CD38 antibody. And this is showing good activity as well as a single agent. So that's nice. You probably know about the elotuzumab data. Elo is another monoclonal, but by itself, it really doesn't have a lot of activity. You have to combine it with ortezomib or with lenalidomide. But both of these CD38 antibodies work fine on their own. And in this phase one, you can see some good responses. And the exciting thing is that this antibody binds a different part of CD38 than does daratumumab. So theoretically, you might be able to use them either together or at least sequentially, one after another, as long as you still have CD38 expression on the myeloma cells. So I think the conclusions I'd like to leave you with, we still need noveler agents for later lines of therapy because the previously novel drugs like bortezomib and lenalidomide are now being used in the upfront setting. And although you can retreat people and still get a benefit, you certainly don't have a 100% response rate, even in people who responded before, showing that there is cross resistance that does develop. We have now second and third generation proteasome inhibitors and imids. And I think that we can now tell that because these have been approved, we haven't exhausted the utility of a proteasome inhibitor or an imid. Some people say, well, you've already got one proteasome inhibitor. What do you need another one for? It turns out that we can still derive a benefit. And maybe some of the newer proteasome inhibitors, like carfilzomib, will turn out to actually be even better than the older ones, like bortezomib. And as I told you earlier, there is one study that's already been completed, although we don't have the data yet, comparing head-to-head -head bortezomib with carfilzomib. That's in the relapsed setting. And in newly diagnosed patients, we have a trial in the US ongoing, which is comparing VRD to CRD, looking at which proteasome inhibitor, basically, with LEN and DEX, gives you a better outcome. We still need more studies for us, I think, to really fully realize the potential of these imids and proteasome inhibitors. And our colleagues at Onyx are at this meeting, so hopefully you will have an opportunity to interact with them and maybe even get some clinical trials up and running because we need to learn a lot more. And new drug classes with new mechanisms of action are entering the fray against myeloma as well. Specifically on carfilzomib, in terms of conclusions, I've shown you that it has excellent activity in the relapsed and refractory setting, and we're learning more about the right dosing and also about the right schedule, and I think we'll have evidence that it works even better once we optimize it. It also is an excellent drug that can be added to other agents and therefore enhance activity further. And I think that approvals for relapse disease and eventually for upfront disease are going to be coming as well. But clearly in the relapse and refractory setting, we still have lots of challenges. First, we need to identify mechanisms of resistance and some associated clinically relevant biomarkers so that we can determine which drugs are best to use rather than just going down the list and using the same drug for everybody, even though we know that 100% of people will not respond. Also, we need to validate additional novel targets that we can add to our armamentarium. And I think you saw earlier from Dr. Chin some of the immunotherapies that look quite exciting. And I think we need to determine the role of minimal residual disease None of us can afford to do chemotherapy as much as we would like, but the hope is that as we get better treatments and patients become MRD negative by a very sensitive assay, perhaps we'll be able to get to the point where we can stop treatment. That will save money and that will make patients happy and maybe then you can restart treatment when the MRD negativity goes to MRD positive. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues at Onyx to just give you an update on their current trials.
and some novel drugs in their pipeline. And again, I'd like to encourage you to talk with them if you have good ideas for trials, because my experience with them has been that they are very excited to work with you, and they're very open to all of the ideas that you have. Thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of your lunch.